Our second speaker in this session is Ms. Christine van het Erwe-Grunet, Managing Director of Renewable Energy for Danish Energy. And I think, again, from our Danish colleagues, we have a lot to learn from offshore wind. So please welcome Christine. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to come here today and uh, tell you a little bit about offshore wind. Um, if I want you to go home with a message today, um, actually for the people representing in this room, when we're talking about offshore wind, basically the sky is the limit. And why am I saying that? Well, that's basically because that Europe has a vast technical potential um, for offshore wind. In a report being launched today, exactly as we are sitting here today, the International Energy Agency is saying that offshore wind in Europe basically can make certain that we will meet the electricity, electricity demand by 10 times in 2040. And especially when we are talking about the Nordic countries, the Baltic and Ireland, we as such have the best wind sites in Europe and in the world. So the sky's the limit, but that means that we also have an obligation to meet the sky and basically make certain that we have the political framework and a dialogue with industry so that we can basically reach that potential. Denmark does have a unique position already. 28 years ago, in 1991, we established our first offshore wind park. Not a lot of people had thought about putting windmills at sea at that point in time. So this was very much due to learnings being made during the 70s, during the oil crisis, and very um, amb ambitious politicians that decided that they, want, they were gonna do something about this and that they were gonna look into renewable agency. A fun fact, the wind park that was established in 1991 delivered green electricity to 2,200 households. 2,200 households. The park that we opened a few months ago, Hornsreut 3, delivers green electricity to 400,000 households. That's 28 years, but it's basically not 28 years in that aspect. It's actually the last 10 years that we've seen huge changes. So, that was the wrong one, that one, sorry. So there's no longer any questions that the role of offshore in meeting our climate goals is going to be central. Offshore wind will not only help to put the global power um, sector on track for full decarbonisation, but it will also become the leading source of electricity in Europe, and it will enable sort of future technologies and sectors that's very difficult today to, to find ways to get rid of fossil fuels, such as the steel uh, industry, the transport sectors we just heard about, and uh, household warming. And just looking back, saying what actually happened in Denmark, and how did we engaged in this travel towards it, starting out as a niche technology and now basically being a front leader in a global technology. There are three major learnings and developments that we should look a little bit more into. Firstly, and that I will not, Denmark cannot a, a alone take credit for that, we've seen massive technology advancement. Um, but the fact, the reasons why we've seen that is also, and this is the second point, that we have looked into a political framework, as we just said, there was an ambition, there was a target, and most importantly, there was a pipeline. So we had governments in, in Denmark, we had governments around us that basically said, we're going to have um, a framework which will support a um, construction of offshore parks and in a steady um, time frame. And last, and I think maybe for, Den for the Danish case, most importantly, we had politicians that were willing to listen. 
looking at the slide I've brought you here, you can see what you can see the strike prices for the last four wind parks, offshore wind parks in Denmark. And in 2010, we had Anhalt as a 400 megawatt offshore park. And the tendering process at that point in time was a very, very restrict regime. It was very difficult to make changes. Penalties were high if you couldn't construct your, your offshore wind park within the specified time. And that meant basically that we might have had an auction scheme that was based on competition, but we only had one bidder. And you might know if you only have one bidder, they basically can set the price as they want to. And they had to set their price high because the risks were high. So what we saw was that we had changes made after that, lots of criticism. Changes were made to the auction schemes. Today, we have a much more flexible system based on dialogue. We have pre-qualification, and when you're pre-qualified, what happens is basically that um, then you start the dialogue with the authorities, and then you can actually change the conditions. If you can provide documentation saying this is going to lower risk, then the conditions are being changed. So what we've seen with the last, um, with the last tendering process, we've seen a reduction in price of 70%, 70%. And we're not finished. Um, I will not go into that, but you can look at, look at that at home. That's basically giving you a bit of details, uh, more details about the tendering process. But what is important, is it all going to be smooth sailing from now on? Well, it looks good. It looks very good. But there are some issues which we have to focus on, um, basically to reach the potentials. And that's the same, I think, for all countries sitting here today and maybe around the world. Maritime spatial planning is going to be key to basically reaching the potentials that are there. We, today, offshore wind is normally the last one to come in when you allocate sites. You have to change this around. Offshore wind has to be prioritized. The other big issue is development on, on, on and offshore infrastructure. This is extremely important. We need to make certain that we can get the green electricity to the consumers that need it. And we have to see totally changes in how we look at grid infrastructure offshore. And that means cooperation among countries that are sitting here today. It's not going to be one station, one nation, <laughs> one park. No, we need to have cooperation between because we basically have to develop an offshore grid that makes the electricity to go to, to different countries at the same time. Lastly, we still need a stable political framework. So we need a framework which will keep on, basically, when, when you have an energy agreement, you have to prepare the next energy agreement, and you have to make the ambition on how much offshore do we want in the next 10 years. The industry needs this. They can deliver, but they have to make sure that there is commitment from the governments. So that was my words today. Thank you very much. Thank you.